Well, that was absolutely fascinating. I'm sure you'll agree. Uh, just a reminder that if you have questions for any of our panelists, you can put them through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. So uh, we will start with the questions. Um, and we're going to start, first of all, uh, with Tom. This is a good start, Tom. Um, so we have here, it's a great song, of course, the song that you played earlier that had been recorded in your department. Where can we go and buy it is the question. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, this is, uh, it's, you can find it via ver the various platforms at the link that I've just put in the chat. Um, I, it's probably going to come up in the later questions, but one feels like a bit of a hypocrite to say, aren't all these streaming platforms uh, somehow flawed or terrible? And then to immediately point you to the song on those platforms. But it, it is there, and I think that will come up in a later question. Uh, that will, the artist, will the artist get paid, though, Tom? That's the thing. Right. <laughs> um, Aidan asks, do you think that a streaming service that paid more towards musicians rather than the 0.001p per play of Spotify would also be a feasible solution as well. Yeah, I think it would be a, a feasible solution. Uh, I think Bandcamp is probably the closest um, solution to that at the moment in that, you know, as well as using it through a desktop or laptop machine, you can get, you know, a convenient to use app version of it on your phone and, and you know, like set the music going and just listen but then there's this kind of tussle between what can you find on there um i think on one of my slides i may have put you know that there's a huge um bias toward the most popular songs and how often those are streamed and so some of these um newer and more innovative platforms they have really interesting ideas behind them but they suffer from not having the big hits that you know we all put on you know be at a certain time of year or when we're feeling a certain way like nostalgia we want to go and find a song by a big artist from 10 years ago might not be on Bandcamp, for example I, th I think the other thing to say about you know um could this come from um one of the existing platforms becoming fairer there was a story of maybe about a month ago about adele managing to convince spotify to take the shuffle button off of her new album you know by default it's on shuffle and she managed to convince them to I think she switched it the other way if that's how much power she can kind of you know bring to bear and that's the change that a big company can make for her I am slightly skeptical that any of the existing companies are just going to turn around and give more of their um, subscription or advertising revenue to the artists just like that Paul asks, how long before this system is bought out by one of the big streamers and the structure changed, they didn't become market leaders without being ruthless? Yeah, like I just indicated, that they're, they're profit driven um, and most of them could also be described as, as monoliths. You know, they're very large organisations, which means that while they might have some bright ideas, um, I think they're quite slow or resistant to pivot from one approach to another. Um, they may, like I said, if profits are under threat or public image is under threat. Um, I think there's, a, there's an interesting paper as well. Um, it's, it's by Georgina Bourne and colleagues. It's called Artificial Intelligence, Music Recommendation and the Curation of Culture. And they just raised some ideas, uh, among other things, about, you know, the way that culture is created at the moment whether it be via Netflix and the way we select from tiles or their suggestions about what to watch or similar in, in Spotify and other music streaming platforms, you know, how that is ordered, how that is presented to us and, and if it were based on other um, priorities other than those companies making more money from us as consumers. So yeah, I think it's a good question and I think some interesting ideas in that article. Uh, Caroline says, Audfolio looks like a fantastic concept to empower music creators and bring more equity to the music industry. Is there a plan to promote it to music creators? Yeah, um, thanks. It's a, a good question. Um, so the, the template is already available for anyone to copy and adapt, and, and I'll put that link there. Um, 
So someone can already go and basically copy and adapt that code um, to their own purposes um, with, with a kind of payment management system integrated and it would need setting up afresh for each person who attempted to do that. On the other side of this, you know, the book that I'm finishing off and hopefully is out later this year, um, we plan to make it open access a year after it's been published, which would mean that a free PDF would be, you know, available in 2023. Um, and then, of course, the real challenge with education is how do you connect those who know how to do something with those who are really interested in, in trying to achieve that same thing. So um, at the moment, you know, beyond um, um, beyond enrolling in the music and sound recording degree at University of York and taking my classes, <laughs> uh, I guess we, we will also put on some workshops that, um, you know, bridge that gap for people, probably Zoom based. We'll see where the pandemic is by that stage. But I would say that if um, people keep their eye on um, if they're interested, I'll put the link again to like where I'm collecting interest in the book. And that's probably also where I will list any public uh, workshops that come up in the next few years. I think it goes without saying, Tom, we all want to sign up to your course, so you don't need to worry about that. <laughs> um, we have a, a question from Chris. Thanks very much, Chris. Uh, much of the attraction to artists of Spotify is that promotes and spreads their art across the global audience that's unaware of the artist. The suggestions here rely on the artist being known by its audience and finding their site. How would you address this extra promotional aspect of the platform i'll let you answer that first because there is a second part to this question yeah that's what i was um getting at with my, with sharing that first link and saying oh yeah it's on all the usual platforms of course no one wants to be missed no one wants to miss out on being discovered right there's, there's a fear of missing out here and that's one of the reasons why the platforms that exist today have managed to grow and kind of have the market um share and, and profits they do um, and I accept that in my yeah in my talk I basically just described how to make standalone sites that people need to know about through some other means in order to find. Um, I, I think that if we look sideways to the creative um, visual sorry visual creative programming movement, there are these kind of standalone sites, and then there are sites that kind of um, have grown up and and aggregate that information and make it possible to discover um, different you know, artists um, in that visual domain. So I can imagine that if the movement can gain some momentum, something similar will happen here. The second part of that question is, how, does, how do you feel about the other avenues for income for artists, such as syndication and royalty collection for songwriters? There are challenges to artists, particularly in the live environment, where many of them are not being recognized by agencies, such as PRS. And instead, funds are being distributed to larger artists due to incorrect uh, algorithms. Linking in with the second speaker, how may AI be able to help correct this? So maybe you can answer that, but also maybe Jen might have a, a suggestion um, on how artificial intelligence um, could help possibly. Yeah. Um, as, as I've interacted with the Performing Rights Society or, or PRS a bit, and, and it does feel a bit out of date uh, or out of touch with how the modern music industry works. You know, there's, there's kind of paper forms to fill out and then you get money, but it can be a long time later. Um, so I think in terms of what's what's the solution, um, yeah, I've, I've I put in a, uh, a grant application, it, it wasn't successful, but it was looking at whether something like blockchain or some other data structures that are somehow, you know, relatively recent and innovative, we all know about them from cryptocurrencies, but basically imagining a world where music creators contributions to songs could be you know, monitored and tracked and, and the, the revenues gained by those songs automatically distributed among the contributors. So AI will be in that mix, I think, um, in terms of managing that so that it works to a, a certain degree. But may, yeah, maybe Jen wants to say something about AI and its potential for solutions to issues in, in society like this. Yeah, uh, sorry, Jen, away you go. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's something that I think that, 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 that needs to be looked at in much more detail. And I think, um, you know, the idea that AI can help identify kind of 
how we might pay pay royalties is certainly something that um, that that I think should be explored. But I think um, again, with all any use of these technologies, more broadly speaking, you know, then we need to be thinking about some of the unintended consequences of, of its application, and not just necessarily think we'll just use AI because we can use AI. Um, and yes, if it can be do, done in a, in a way that that makes sense and and is is a useful predictive um, tool um, and, and in a transparent way we're, we're understanding the, the, the different demographics that we're, we're trying to model if you like or understand and that might make sense to do so but there are so many different variables um, when we think about live music and when we think about how um, different players uh, and different performers and different stakeholders within that might have different intentions in the, in a, in appropriate. Um, sort of behaviours that we need to think about, whether we just blindly use AI for everything. <laughs> Uh, Jen, thank you very much, and Tom as well, and Chris, uh, thank you for your question. Uh, a question now for John Schofield, uh, talking about the seahorse and uh, the cotton bud. Um, some shocking statistics there, I'm sure we were all very taken aback with, with, with what John showed us today. Um, Lydia says, when you say how long till it's gone, does that mean gone and safe or not? Yeah, good question. And of course, we've no idea, really. Plastic's uh, only been around for 100 years, so we, we, don't, we don't know how long it's going to survive for and whether that does refer to its physical form or whether it has some sort of toxic legacy that, um, that outlasts the, the object itself. Um, personally, I think those estimates in that illustration, 450 years for a plastic bottle, for the item itself are, are very conservative. Um, I wouldn't be at all surprised if I was to travel into the future several thousand years to find plastic bottles from our era still surviving in, in, um, in various settings. Um, and then once the bottle has gone, of course, there may well still be some legacy that survives beyond that as well. So the answer is we don't know, but I suspect those figures are very conservative. Uh, from Paul, are there other significant sources of pollution in the Galapagos other than plastics? Yeah, good question. Um, I mean, the plastic is is an obvious one and, and arguably the main one. Um, there are other sources of pollution. They, they tend to be much more um, ad hoc and occasional, such as oil spills, for example. And the, the oil spills don't tend to be from things like um, big container ships because they, um, they, they, they tend to bypass Galapagos and there hasn't yet I don't think been a an oil spill that's impacted on Galapagos of that scale but but lots of smaller boats um, can leak oil um, in the harbours for example um, and in sensitive areas there was a spillage um, a few years ago now within the harbour on one of the one of the islands and that had a, an, a local impact by which I mean you know within the immediate environment of that of that spill but plastic is the main one. The, the, the challenge with the plastic is that a lot of it isn't actually coming from Galapagos. So it's not, their, it's not their fault, if you like. The plastic is actually coming from much further afield um, from the coast of South America, from the international fishing fleet that fishes legally outside of the, um, uh, the exclusion zone. But the plastics that are coming from those places and those activities are coming into the, um, coming into the archipelago and impacting it. A question from Susan. Has the project brought about any tangible change in behaviours? Yeah, that's an excellent, excellent question. Of course, that's the that's the object in all of this is to is to try to get to a point where 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 people are more responsible in their use of plastics. And I've, as I've just explained, the um, it's not so much a local problem in the sense that only 10 percent of the plastic items that we're picking up off the beaches in Galapagos are from local sources. Um, and you could argue, I suppose, that much of that is accidental. It's very windy in Galapagos. And I've seen for myself um, plastic, empty plastic bottles that have been put in rubbish bins, being blown out of the rubbish bins onto the beach and presumably into the sea. So some of it may, may be purely accidental. Um, but the bigger problem and the behaviour that really needs to be changed is, is a, is a, it's a systemic one, but it's also an in, it's industry specific. So a lot of the plastics in Galapagos, probably around 30%, maybe more, um, is coming from the international fishing fleet. 
And this is leaving aside a lot of the fishing gear that's being discarded when things are broken, they're just thrown over the side. A lot of this is, is what you might call domestic material. So the plastic water bottles, um, that, if you remember that image of me and someone else looking at a, a little plastic container, that's a, a small plastic container that can, contained a detergent. And these objects full are taken onto the, to the fishing boats, which spend months at sea sometimes. Um, and they're very confined spaces with very lim limited storage. And of course, when things like um, detergent containers and water bottles are empty, they're not put in some big bin somewhere to be taken back to wherever the fishing fleet came from, but they're thrown overboard. And that's, that's the, a large part of the problem in Galapagos in particular. And that's one of the problems that need, needs to be resolved. And, that, and that's not necessarily about individual behaviours, although it might be to some extent, it's more about addressing that problem on an industry-wide scale in a specific context of, of Southeast Asia, which is where most of these fishing fleets are coming from. I'm going to add on the back of that, whose responsibility is that? Because, you know, for, for us to deal with the problem, particularly in Galapagos, as you say, behaviours have to change, but who has to take that responsibility to make sure it happens? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm focusing on the most difficult part of this challenge. So we know we know some of the plastic is coming from Galapagos, not much of it, but some of it. We know some of the plastic, quite a lot of it, in fact, is coming from mainland South America. So we have projects within the context of this program based in coastal communities in South America, which are working with people in the same way that we did in Galapagos to try to address the problem there and to try to impact and change their behaviours for the better and to be more responsible and so forth. But the fishing fleet is a very particular problem. It's, I, mean, I, I refer to it as the international fishing fleet, um, but a lot of the fishing boats that we know operate just outside the protected waters of Galapagos are from places like the Philippines and from China. Um, they're vast fishing fleets. You can spot, you can spot them and plot their movements on, on, um, online. So you can see how big they are, how long they spend at sea. Um, and, and even if you manage to change behaviours at kind of the, the level of governance and how, how the fleets are policed in theory, um, and you might come up with a policy, for example, that instructs the fleets to make sure that they manage their waste, how that then translates into actual behaviours on a fishing boat, um, very remote and, uh, and where no one is watching, basically. That's another question altogether. I think it's a it's a it's a massive challenge, and it's uh, but it's one that you know we need to address. Uh, so, from Andrew, uh, a question and a comment. Great talk and a very interesting project. Um, and Andrew is being quite cheeky here and uh, kind of getting in there. I think. Are you at all interested in advising the friends of the chalk tower at Flamborough on how we might adopt comparable methodologies to monitor plastic uh, waste on beaches and coastal landscapes on the Yorkshire coast? Well, I know it's not the same place, but I did mention Bridlington, so I guess I, <laughs> guess I asked for that. Um, but absolutely, yeah. I mean, I think this is a, what we're trying to develop here is a method that can be can be used anywhere. Um, so, so this idea of collecting objects, looking at them, giving them an archeological um, uh, view, if you like, and trying to interpret them and where they came from and the behaviors that led to them ending up on a beach in Scarborough or Bridlington or Galapagos or wherever it might be. This is a methodology that we're, we're looking to roll out and try out and test in different places. So yeah, I'm very happy to have that conversation. Thank you, John. Uh, a question for Jen now, and just a reminder, of course, that you've still got time to get your questions in, just use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, what considerations are there for children's storytelling and conversational AI, and how has regional restrictions on knowledge sharing also affected AI use and freedom? Uh, thank you for those questions. They're very different. Um, I'll try and address them. Um, the first one, um, so how does AI um, affect children, I suppose, more generally? So we did some work on conversational AI for children, in particular, Google Home, Alexa, and, and uh, we developed a meta story chat tool to help a child engage with their favorite TV show. Um, it would then, uh, you know, the credits would, would roll and the child would be able to interact with, with the character at the end of the program. 
Um, uh, and we worked with a company on this to kind of look at the impacts on a child's cognitive linguistic development, so how they how how far they're educated, how much far they understand AI as a result, their learning and their access, if you like. But also, we were interested in thinking about what the kind of ethical implications were. Um, thinking about on civility, how children treat these 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 systems, um, privacy, how um, how. Uh, how children's data and of course parental consent plays into the development of these technologies um, and also just thinking about how uh, those implications then sort of sort of uh, affect their everyday lives in terms of their behaviors so for instance how children are used to asking a question to a, a system an alexa for example and how that might then translate into how they treat their parents so Alexa's answering me quite quickly. <laughs> um, their question asking abilities will be affected by the, the way in which this, these systems are designed. Why doesn't mum always answer me as quickly as Alexa? Um, how's that gonna affect their behavior? And, and it's a very serious issue actually, because you know these are things that we're seeing now very ubiquitously, ubiquitously in our lives. Um, and you know um, many children will have these things in, in their homes. So I think on, on a variety of levels, uh, storytelling of course is, is is there to entertain, to educate, and to engage a child. We want to make sure that it's fun, but also that it's safe. Um, and we have uh, done a lot of work on the ethical implications of that. More broadly, I suppose, the question then about how AI impacts our rights to freedom of expression and, and how different, um, different countries, uh, different uh, approaches um, will be affected. I mean, AI is, is, is applied in a vast number of, of, of situations and they're gonna uh, affect and influence individuals access and, and, and how they find information online. And we see that that's the case with social media and things like that, and they're AI driven. And in some cases, things like that have seemed relatively benign or benevolent. Um, but of course, others have quite serious uh, repercussions if we think about uh, facial recognition systems um, and large sort of targeted surveillance in, in different in, in different areas. And there's a lot of work on, you know, kind of uh, democracy and fairness and thinking about how we ensure that these systems are, are safe and, and protect our privacy and ultimately don't negatively impact our human rights. I mean, that's an, an enormous question, but I think something that the research efforts really focused on at the moment um, and in areas you know, where there is uh, limits on, on knowledge sharing. Um, I think that's a particularly pertinent question. For instance, drawing it back neatly to the children aspect, we've seen quite recently how China, for example, is, is cracking down on the use of AI, conversational AI um, for children uh, and gaming, uh, which obviously sometimes relies on AI uh, and introducing curfews and things of that nature. So they're gonna access it somehow and we've got to think about what the, the limits are and, and the kind of the ways to regulate that. Uh, another one for you, you mentioned the cataclysmic sound being very emotive and that they are, <laughs> AI is often viewed as inherently negative or positive rather than a tool to be used one way or the other. In your opinion, what should AI sound like? Okay, I mean, it's not, it wouldn't necessarily be my opinion, it would be based on our research, but I think, so we we're uh, interviewing composers and sound designers of AI documentaries. So documentary, you would assume, is, is tr attempting to get at the truth, and I use my fingers like that, because, you know, trying to get at the truth of this technology, and we're seeing more and more doc documentaries about AI, uh, BBC Click, for example, do um, a series, uh, and then you also see uh, films that are coming out. So, for example, Coded Bias on Netflix, which talks about algorithmic injustice, a very good depiction. Uh, somebody else asked about which what were, were good depictions and what were good portrayals of AI. That is one example of a very uh, fair and accurate representation of some of the issues of AI. Um, but then also, um, there are other examples of AI where you might uh, you might it might be soundtrack to promote a positive or a negative feeling. Um, often, what we've seen in our research so far, and it's very much in its early stages, is that documentary sound designers are trying to use sound, use use uh, use music to kind of negate human humanity in a sense at the outset. So rather than using a specific tone, if you like, they're trying to uh, make deliberate decisions to not necessarily accentuate an emotional line, for example, if they're trying to uh, promote an understanding of a machine or a system. They might instead, to link to Tom's talk, use AI. <laughs> they might use more 
electronic um, music to potentially soundtrack when they're trying to get across something about AI versus something like uh, an actual, you know, a, 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 an analog sound or a, a more ambient or lyrical sound, which we might then feel is more human inherently. Um, so I think there's not a sound that AI should sound like unless in that well it very much depends on what we're trying to get across if we're trying to hype then it may well be that we have these calamitous sounds but if we're trying to be more um accurate and straightforward about what ai is we might want to think about what we associate with the human what we associate with technology um, and try and find some kind of middle ground um, to avoid these kind of poles um, quite a nice follow on and you've kind of hinted at it, but what depictions of AI in media are accurate, stroke authentic? In media, I mean, mm. I think um, I think one of the things that we're seeing is that there are there are increasingly, um, you know, portrayals of AI in, in let's say let's take something like on, on TV, for instance. Um, and I think one thing that you can you, you want to be looking for it's more about what, it, what you would want to be looking for is whether it's if it's supposed to be sort of a non-fiction portrayal then you know the kind of the the element of expertise and the storytellers within within those de depictions i mentioned code advice before because i think it's a really good example it's been uh designed and, and led by the algorithmic injustice uh, justice league rather not injustice justice league and what they're focusing on is thinking about how bias can seep, seep into coding um, uh, and how bias can seep into to AI design. And that's not to, to, to be an overly negative uh, portrayal, but it's to talk about the realities, the very real issues that, that are behind some of the, the, the coding decisions in, te in technology and, and thinking about how that affects marginalized groups. So for example, thinking about um, race and technology gender and technology. Um, and so something like that, which has got a broad range of storytellers who are coming from a range of different racial backgrounds, genders, um, and hopefully also coming from a range of different privileges as well um, as telling the story. Um, and then of course, you know, using examples and cases in the real world to kind of really ground the, 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 the stories. I think that's probably where you would want to start. I would be wary of a documentary or a piece of storytelling about AI that was entirely written and funded and described by Silicon Valley, big tech, you know, the, the same demographic. And they're out, they're out there and they exist. And I would just encourage people to just think, okay, where's the motivation behind this story? Who, who benefits from this story? Is it, is it, to, is it to scare me? Is it to, what, what's the motivation there? Am I to buy a product? So I think that's just one of the things we're finding increasingly about um, this is to interrogate that. And we know that hype is there for a reason, but that it's not always helpful. Uh, George asks, you mentioned several narratives around AI. I was wondering if, in your opinion, there are dominant narratives about AI that have to be challenged by scholars. Um, well, in our research, we, um, we, uh, I spoke to all of the many leading experts in, in AI, um, and many of them felt that there was a need to dismantle brand narratives. And, and again, these kind of polarised positions. Um, that encourage a kind of binary position of light or dark. Um, instead, they want a more kind of uh, accurate portrayal of where the technology is today. So how it affects us on the everyday, I think everyday is a really interesting point to make. Um, so I think one of the most unhelpful sort of um, narratives that many of our experts sort of described were the kind of the robot uprising kind of um, narrative um, an over simplification of the kind of job loss narrative as well because of course AI could create jobs as many and Tom's talked about this you know uh, as many as it may um, threaten in some sense um, and um, and of course there's also issues around you know the kind of the, the narratives about anthropomorphized um, AI as well um, and then on the flip side these kind of myopic bright side in the AI is going to be the solution to all of our problems. Um, I think those disma the dismantling of those distracting um, sort of uh, grand scale narratives can help bring us back to the everyday a little bit. Um, you know, it's very current, it's, it's everywhere. We, we only had to see last week in the news, BBC talking about how AI had, um, a, a child had put their 
uh, had been asked by an Alexa to put a 10p in a, in a, in a plug socket in a challenge on Alexa. These are, you know, this is an incredibly important um, problem that we need to address. Um, so, and that's not, you know, that's the everyday, that's in our lives, that's in our homes. That, that, and I think those are the kind of, you know, discussions that we should be having, okay, about, about AI, not necessarily those that just appeal to the, to the grand narratives. As, as fun and as interesting as some of those are, they're often proliferated by a few, a small few. Um, and people with questionable motives sometimes. <laughs> uh, thanks, Jen. Uh, Claire, we do have a couple of questions for you, which are coming up very shortly. Uh, Tom, I have another one for you, uh, which is now that many artists, this is from Mike, now that many artists are selling the rights to their catalogues to big music companies, does this cause more barriers to new artists? Yeah, it's a good question, and I'm not sure is my answer. <laughs> um, if we think about why people are buying up um, really well-known artists' um, catalogues in a kind of wholesale way, I think it's because, as I mentioned earlier, there is such a strong, um, you know, waiting and listening statistics to, you know, the top um, section of of um, you know, most popular artists, most popular songs. So clearly, you know, the 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 in investors, um, the investing world is seeing that and seeing that there's long term um, revenue to be made from bodies of music by recognized stars. And so I think, yeah, naturally, that would then kind of seem like the market is somewhat flooded and it becomes increasingly difficult for, for new artists to get a foot in the door. Thank you. Uh, Claire, a question for Claire. Could you comment on the importance of cooking and food to the assimilation and well-being of refugees and immigrants from Southeast Asia? A really good question, and it's really important. Um, and I immediately thought of a book by Anshul Malhotra called Remnants of the Separation, which is a, it's a cultural history, material history of India and partition through objects. Um, and so Malhotra looks at what refugees carried with them and the terrible bloodshed when the British rushed to leave India in 1947. And one of the objects that she spends a lot of time on is a cooking pot. Um, so, you know, these things are so important. And if I can just, you know, just say what she says about that. She said the mother's main concern had been food, but because they couldn't flee with eatables, she made sure to carry their utensils so that at least if ration was given in the camp, they would have a means to cook with. As a result, what was accompanied with them were petal plates, tumblers, carries and spoons. So I think that's, just, that's quite a historic example, but I think even in the more recent European refugee crisis, um, the same sort of stories are there because I think food is about community, it's about sharing, it's also about dignity and independence and culture and memories. Um, I'll ask you this one as well, Claire. Is there a role for, this is from Gillian, thank you Gillian, is there a role for South Asian restaurants in the UK to reflect and celebrate a wider array of cuisines and to coax people into trying a much more diverse array of food? It's difficult because of the history, because as you probably know, that um, the real sort of boom of Indian restaurants was from about the 60s onwards. Um, restaurants were mostly run by Saleti Bangladeshis, but were called Indian restaurants. And they, you know, I was talking about stereotypes a little bit in my talk. And that's, you know, <laughs> What, they were catering to this quite limited palate that, that British people had in the 60s, so that the sort of chicken tikka masala, you know, developed, which isn't an Indian dish, this sort of penchant for, for meat with gravy, so that, you know, it's a kind of hybrid cuisine, and we've got very used to that, and then out of Birmingham came the Balti, so we've got this very sort of limited repertoire, as you say, and it's a very good question, but I think things are beginning to change, and especially in cities like Leeds, where I am, and Bradford, even, you know, amazing, and, and Manchester, I think you do see, and London, of course, um, very multicultural cities, you're seeing, you know, chai shops opening with halva puri, you know, the sort of, like, um, nashta that, that everyday people would eat in the subcontinent, you know, normal breakfasts, and also some very fun kind of 
fusion cuisine like in Bradford there's a famous gulab jamun cheesecake you can try so you know I think it is changing and also of course the regional cuisine so I can just off the top of my head in Leeds think of an amazing Punjabi restaurant um, with chart that's to die for extremely spicy very popular with Punjabis in the local area there's Kerala and restaurants specifically Bengali places so I think I think things are starting to change but there is obviously what you're describing is still the majority, unfortunately. So baby steps. What do you believe is the connection between music and food? I love this one because I'm a literature person. So obviously I thought of Shakespeare, if music be the food of love. And then that made me think, I mean, they're all sexy, they're bodily, they're enjoyable and sensual. I think there's a strong connection and, and it's no surprise that we like to listen to music when we eat. And what is your favourite South Asian dish? We're all getting very hungry now talking about food. <laughs> I put on, I must say, I put on about £10 doing this book. Um, and that's the most difficult question I've ever been asked, but luckily I've had time to think about it. And I'd have to go for dal because dal's such a staple and there's so many different kinds. If I say dal, then I hold on to a lot of different things. Uh, thank you very much indeed. I think that is the end of our questions. So uh, thank you very much uh, for all those questions. I'm sure you agree it's been an absolutely fascinating afternoon. Uh, thank you to all of you for joining us for our final York Talk session. Thank you to our brilliant speakers recordings of all of today's fantastic talks will be available to watch again in a few days time on the University of York YouTube channel. Now, if you've been with us all day, you'll know that alongside the York Talks presentations, there's also been an online exhibition of posters by 10 PhD researchers. I'm now delighted to announce the three winners as selected by the research theme champions and the Dean of the York Graduate Research School, Professor Kay Arnold, and unveil the People's Choice winner as well. So, uh, like all good competitions, we'll go from third to first. So, in third place, it is, and I hope that's not going to put everybody off that's now going to show these on screen. Uh, in third place is Jess Gibson. So, well done to you, Jess. In second place is Manly Zoo. In first place, it is Daisy McManaman. So well done to you, Daisy. The People's Choice goes to Sonam Sidhu. Congratulations to all of our winners. I'd now like to hand over to Joan Concannon, who will close the session.